Welcome to the Elliot Hulse Podcast. Podcast. I am the king of making men strong. Shedding of the old man, right? The way we can freely walk into rising, ascending, cleansing, sanctifying our soul for it's the Yo Elliot God. Show. I like that. If you're a high achieving businessman, executive, or entrepreneur who's dominating in business but struggle with drinking, drugs, overeating, or any filthy vice, here's some advice. The biggest mistake that you could make is to try to quit cold turkey and use willpower to overcome your cravings. If you've ever quit for a few days or a few weeks only to self sabotage by binging worse than before, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. Not only has my company helped thousands of men destroy vice and dominate life, I personally confronted and overcome the same struggles when I found myself hooked on weed at the peak of my business career. If you've got four minutes to listen to a coach who will help you achieve total self-mastery and control over your inner punk, then listen up. If you don't beat drinking, drugs, or any life-draining dependency in 90 days or less, not only will my company give you your money back, we'll pay for your first month's stay at a rehab retreat of your choice. That's what you need to succeed. So let's go, bro. Just visit waronvice.com fill out an application and my team will get back to you with the details hope to see you on the inside done yo bros we're back with another yo elliot show or the elliot hulls podcast here and uh today's guest is somebody that i discovered shortly after returning to the faith and uh what i learned from this gentleman shook up my world and um if you look at the church today right uh there are a lot of things about it that people resist. There are a lot of things about it that uh, makes people upset. Uh, I know for me, in returning to the faith, one of the things I had to confront was the pedophilia and sexual scandal in the church. And then if you look today, a lot of people, the first thing that they'll question is, why is the church so liberal? They have questions about our Pope. Why does he say and do certain things? Even my 90-year-old aunt, uh, when I asked her about the Pope, she said, he confuses me. And so our guest uh, put it in my ear and then put it in my mind as I studied his book that the church itself has been infiltrated from without and that enemies of the church, which date back a long time ago, uh, have infiltrated the church and their attempt was to destroy it from the inside. So please help me welcome Dr. Taylor Marshall, author of Infiltration, the plot to destroy the church from within. Thank you. Yo, Elliot. Thanks for having me. <laughs> this is awesome. It's it's great to get with you uh, on my show. I was on your show. Uh, we met personally recently, and so a lot of what you've taught and what you continue to teach uh, has been very helpful to me. But uh, I was also so there's this term called red pale rage when guys first discover the gynocentric. Uh, model that we've been living under. So when I, it was almost like a, a rage when I discovered that my beloved church that I was so graciously accepted back into uh, is a shadow of its former self, and it's not by accident. Can you tell us more about this infiltration that you're proposing and how it happened? Yeah, I think red pill is a, is a good analogy. You know, when you talk about the gynocentric worldview, and I think that you know every. Everything flows downhill. So the corruption that we see in society and the dissolving of traditional uh, male-female roles, male-female polar polarity, all of that runs downstream from the corruption of spiritual principles and what has gone before us. So if people are outraged about what they see as cultural chaos, and the destruction of marriage, family, um, even what it is to be a man or a woman, they need to look further back. They need to explore, well, how did we become tolerant of no-fault divorce? How do we become tolerant of abortion? How do we become tolerant, and this is gonna maybe ruffle some feathers, contraception. Because if you can say men and women can have sexual intercourse and then strip away procreation from that, 
I mean, you're just a few jumps away to same-sex marriage or redefining what male and female is anyway. So that's kind of a, a setup for what we're going to talk about. And that is, if you were Satan, if you were a devil, where would be your ground zero? Where would be where you want to hit the hardest? Yes, yeah, you want everyone the, uh, to go to hell, but you're going to focus primarily on the most important spiritual leaders, the most important pastors. And for 2,000 years, the hub, the center of Christianity has been Rome. St. Paul wrote his most important epistle in the New Testament to the church in Rome. St. Ignatius of Antioch wrote his most important epistle to the church in Rome. I mean, and many have argued even the book of the Apocalypse, the book of Revelation is about this interface that's foretold in the prophet Daniel, where he sees four kingdoms and the Messiah coming in the fourth kingdom. And that fourth kingdom is the Roman Empire. It's the most terrible beast described by Daniel. So if we understand demonic strategy, they're going to focus on Rome. And so my study, my research, my book traces the past 200 years and how the enemies of Christ, the powers of darkness, focused on corrupting the church from within, primarily by focusing on Rome. And so who is this enemy here on earth? You know, of course we could say Satan, but you uh, pull no punches in describing who these people are that began to unfold this plot. Can you tell us more about who they are and why? So as you just mentioned, St. Paul says, ultimately our enemies are not flesh and blood. It's true that the fight happens down here, but ultimately our adversary are the spiritual principalities, dominions, the demons, the fallen angels. Those, that's ultimately, those are our adversaries. But here on earth, they trick and twist groups of people to undermine that which is good, true, and beautiful. And since the 1800s, that infiltration has been done by secret societies. Now, a lot of people right now are like, oh, here we go. Get your tinfoil hat out. We're going to get into right. conspiracy theories. We are. We are going to get into that. And, and for you to understand what a conspiracy theory was, not like what CNN says, but what it was, and then also to understand secret societies, you have to understand that when we had a Christian culture, you couldn't just go out and say, you know what, maybe we should have atheistic laws. You know, maybe the French Revolution was a good thing. Let's, let's institute that in all of our nations. Let's abolish Christian monarchies. Let's abolish Christian laws, for example, on abortion or keeping Sunday holy. If you said that stuff in the 800s, 1200s, 1500s, 1600s, even the 1700s, it's extremely scandalous. You could lose your life. You could lose your influence. You could lose your position. And so because of that, the people who were the most subversive to culture had to do it in secret. And that's called a secret society. It's, it's not a conspiracy a false conspiracy theory or tinfoil hat. It's just that if you were a progressive, if you were a liberal, you would have to meet with your friends and discuss these things, not on the internet, but in a secret group. And those are called secret societies, most of which are, are associated with the term Freemasonry, but not necessarily Freemasonic. It could be other secret societies. And so what you see in the 1800s, particularly on the 1830s, there's a, a secret society in Italy, and one of their documents got leaked, and it was made known to the Pope, and it was later published by the late 1800s. It's called the Alta Vendita. And the Alta Vendita basically said, look, Christianity has to go away. We got to get rid of Christianity. We need a secular society, right? They wanted what Canada and the Democrats want for America. That's what they wanted. The biggest resistance is the church. And so what we have to do, we can't attack it from the outside. Nero did that. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Domitian tried that. Blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Napoleon tried it even before that. The French Revolution, the Protestant Reformation, all these major attacks on the church ultimately made the church grow. 
and get stronger. So the solution in the Alta Vendita is instead of attacking from the outside in a public way, let us infiltrate, let us sneak in, let us actually plant infiltrators as priests, monks, nuns, bishops, cardinals, and the Alta Vendita says, maybe even one day we will get the papacy. So it was, and it says a hundred years. So this is a slow roll. This is a long time strategy of secular, atheistic, anti-Christian thinkers who are going to spend at least a hundred years infiltrating the church in order to destroy Christian culture. And my thesis, and I think it's proven to be true, especially over the past three or four years, is that that has indeed happened. And we're actually at the end game of that infiltration. And, and we've seen a collapse of Christian culture in the last 50 years. Wow, it's interesting. In studying some of what happened with the Bolshevik Revolution, I came across the writings of guys like uh, Antonio Gramsci and, and Herbert Marcuse, and I discovered the Frankfurt School and when reading the list of what the Alta Vendita intended to do, right, which basically, for a lack of better terms, is to degenerate all of society, it seems as if, I don't know if it was a coordinated attack, but the attempt to take over the movies, the news, the media, the music, the entire American culture with these communist ideas is exactly what happened with the church. And it's almost like... it. You, you, I think you may have said before that like, as the church goes, so does society. It seems as if this has been a coordinated attack both against the church itself and the order of society. Is that correct? Yeah, that's exactly correct. So that's what, what we're up against. And so I think what we need to do is we need to realize their strategy. We have to identify it. We have to realize what they have done. We, we have to neutralize it, right? And then we, we have to have a game plan moving forward to preserve Christian culture, at least for myself, my wife, and my kids. And you talk a lot about that, right? At least preserve it in your own kingdom, in your own domicile, in your own home. And then reach out to others, and I think you would agree, the strategy here is to other men, so that they can also establish normalcy, a supernatural home, where Christ is king, right? And where matrimony is honored and where children are nurtured and brought up in the fear of the Lord. If we don't accomplish that, we lose everything. Discovering this infiltration through your YouTube videos and your book and stuff also kind of gave me a sense of hope, right? Because there was this idea that I had and that a lot of people have that the church is just corrupt. That's what happens when you give people power, uh, and that the church was just like any other institution that's uh, that's subject to entropy, and so of course it's falling apart. Uh, it's the it's in due time everything fall, you know. So the whole idea that it's it's in, it's just normal and natural that Christianity goes away. The fact is that there was an attack on the culture, attack on the church that from the inside made it sick, such that it's on its bed right now. Um, and it's interesting, too, because of how much of a parallel uh, Pope Benedict plays in almost like this the, 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 the ceremonial death or removal and then death of the church itself. I'm kind of ranting a little bit here, but can we talk a little bit about what the intentions, not the intentions, but the, the means by which the infiltration would happen? So seminaries. Uh, we talk, you know, we could we could talk parallel between the culture and the church, but sexual revolution, all these various tactics that they deployed in order to get us to where we are today. Yeah. So the Alta Vendita explicitly states, "Hey, in our time period, which was the early 1800s, we are not going to be that successful in getting the current generation to totally throw off Christian norms." It states that. So what it suggests is, let us enter into the seminaries to get the next generation of clergy and the schools in order to get the young. It specifically states that in the Alta Vendita. So instead of trying to pervert and corrupt 
culture as is, they said, well, let's just punt and let's aim for 40 years down the road. So if we can infiltrate schools and seminaries, that means that the next generation will be a little bit more liberal, a little bit more progressive, a little bit more communist, socialistic, and then we'll hit them again. So after 100 years, you got three generations almost of compromise. So that's going to put you, if you follow the history, it's going to put you in about 1950. And, uh, you know, I was just doing another interview not long ago uh, today with uh, Jack Posobiec, and we were reading um, Anne Catherine Emmerich. She's a Catholic mystic in the 1800s. And she received a vision that Satan would be unleashed and his demons uh, 50 or 60 years before the year 2000. And when you think about that and you think about the Alta Vendita and the timing, it's just dead on. Yeah. By the 1940s and the 1950s, you have the school system secularized and you have an enormous amount of the clergy who are compromised into secular accepting and promoting secular ideals and then what we would call social, uh, a social justice gospel or liberation theology that's already fermented and is coming, you know, it, it's developed by 1950. And then by the 1960s, I mean, the mask is off. They're on parade. You know, it's complete sexual degeneracy, complete degradation of manhood, uh, the dissolution of the family. And I think we could all agree that from the 1960s, we've been in a downward spiral. So the 1960s, yeah, we saw the sexual revolution in the culture. Um, and then in the church, we saw a liturgical revolution, if I may, as well. And so about the same time that the culture really began to accelerate, it, accelerate its rot, uh, the church turned away from its traditional liturgy, uh, among other things, and then instorted uh, what is basically, uh, it, it's translated as the New World Order <laughs> Mass. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. So... In 1963, in the Catholic Church, there was a council called the Second Vatican Council, and they had a document called Sacrosanctum Concilium, and it called for a new, updated, more relevant, modern take on liturgy. And what they really wanted was lay people to physically be active during the liturgy and also to have a full cognitive understanding of the words and the action of the liturgy of the mass. And mm -hmm. so that meant, for example, getting rid of Latin, even though they said Latin should be retained, it wasn't um, vernacular. And then making sure that lay people are involved. So like before Vatican II, the priest gave you Holy Communion, the Eucharist on your tongue, you knelt down, right? After Vatican II, you have lay people, like even your, like your grandma or Aunt Rita, Lay women are giving communion in the hands through a line, very much kind of like a fast food scenario. And right. so the mass became much more pedestrian, much more banal. And as a result, lots of people stopped going to mass. In fact, if you go to Europe, it's mostly empty churches on a Sunday, which is very sad. And that decline happens beginning at 1969, 1970, when they changed the liturgy. A lot of people, I was talking to a friend last night, we had like a, a men's night, Bible night with cigars, and he said his uncle, after they put in the new mass in 1970, he just wouldn't go. He's like, that's not what I was raised on. That's not the mass, this is something new. He wouldn't go. Now, we could debate on his catechesis, but for a lot of people, this was cataclysmic. This was apocalyptic. They didn't understand one year, this was Catholicism. The next year, it's something totally different. And so this undermined the faith. Why was it done? I mean, I explored in the book Infiltration. It was the, the new liturgy was designed by a man named Archbishop Annabal Bugnini. And he was very progressive, very modernistic. And there's a story that I document in the book that he was having a meeting in Rome on the liturgy, and he left his briefcase behind. A young Dominican found the briefcase, didn't know who it was, opened it to find out, and inside were all these Freemasonic secret society documents. And after that was revealed, the Pope demoted him and sent him to Iran, where he was basically had no influence and no power. But if that story is true, if that's legitimate, that means that the prayers, the liturgy, the calendar, 
basically everything prayed by Catholics since 1970 was reformulated by someone who was Freemasonic, someone who was an infiltrator. I don't want that. If I were to say to you, Elliot, I got two prayers you can pray today. One is from the ancient church, right? By written down by martyrs and holy bishops and great saints of the church. And then here's a prayer written by uh, a Freemasonic liberal guy. I mean, which prayer do you want to pray? Right. The former. Mm -hmm. And that's how I am too. So a lot of people, especially in the Catholic church, who are becoming aware of this long-term infiltration, they're saying, I want to raise my family and attend the traditional liturgy, whether that's the divine liturgy of the Eastern church or the traditional Latin mass, because you're getting the prayers in the, in the calendar and the feast days and the sacraments in the traditional pristine ways and not through the lens of 1960s progressivism. Does that make sense? Yeah, a hundred percent. And so let's backtrack for a moment. So that kind of brings us to where we are today. And then I'd like to talk about Pope Francis in a moment, but I don't want to get too far away from uh, when and how these changes started happening and what the intention of these people were and are. Like, why infiltrate the church? Uh, what are you trying to achieve? And, um, you know, where where is this all headed? Yeah, I mean, you have to remember... Ultimately, God has designed every human person to love him, to not sin, and to be in communion with him and communion with one another. That's, that's the intention, that's the plan, that's the ideal. Original sin has broken that. Ever since Adam and Eve, we have concupiscence, right? We have in our flesh this inordinate desire to rebel against God and to live for ourselves, and that is... We are, we are coached and we are cheered on by Satan and the demons to indulge in our concupiscence, in our flesh. And God, in order to redeem us and correct us, has sent Jesus Christ in the world. He's established a plan. He's given us a Bible. He's given us seven sacraments and prayers and liturgies in order to sanctify ourselves and conform to God. Anyone who does not come on plan with Jesus Christ, who's the same yesterday, today, and forever, they are going to have disordered passions. I mean, even people who are serving Christ have disordered problems. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but those who are yeah. completely separated from God and his grace and his love and his mercy, they are going to have a disordered appetite for evil and for selfishness. They're going to maybe not in the most sinful ways, but they are going to tend their entire life towards I am God, I serve myself, I am number one. They're not going to be sacrificial. They're not going to be charitable. They're not going to love their neighbor as their self. So they're going to love themselves first. Anyone who is like that is going to resent, hate, and fight against. Tooth and nail, they're going to fight against anyone who's saying, no, 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 you shouldn't be doing that. You should be serving Jesus. Just look at what's happened in the last two weeks. I got to be careful what I say here. Look what's happened in the last two weeks with the certain movement of people wanting to identify as something else. It's violent. It's, it's crazy. You've got corporations, sec secular corporations endorsing it full on. They want to destroy everything that Christ wants for us. They, they think... I want to be free means I can do with my genitals whatever I want, and I can put whatever substances into my body for the maximum amount of pleasure based on my genitals and drugs. And then add into it lower things like streaming Netflix or going to Disney World so or whatever. So what I hear right? you saying, it's a, it's a resistance against order, which is a natural... It's a, which it, when you consider that God the Father created everything through the Logos, the Word of God, right. who is Jesus Christ, the created order as planned by God is all through the matrix, and I use matrix in a good way here, not a bad way, not mm -hmm. like an Andrew Tate way, the matrix of the Logos. There's a game plan, there's a blueprint for reality, and that's all through the Logos, to the, and the Logos is Jesus Christ. 
So to the extent that you reject the Logos, which is you reject Jesus Christ, if this is the Logos, the further you get from Logos, the more you descend into chaos over here. Mm -hmm. Or if you want to put Logos up here, as you remove yourself, you're descending into chaos. And that's what we're seeing right now in our culture. Chaos. Use a, a term. Where people are not just move. They are rejecting logos. They are rejecting natural law. They are rejecting divine law. They are rejecting concepts like male, female, matrimony, law, nation, sovereignty, property. All of these basic things are being rejected entirely, and that's because people are rejecting logos. So. You use a term, I think, that you pulled from the uh, Freemasons who use the who said against cross and crown. Everything they do is against cross and crown. Cross and crown being superstructures, as Nietzsche would call it, or or an authority. You also, I, I think, I remember reading that we could date back this diabolical dissolution that we find ourselves in right now to even the Protestant Reformation, you know, over five hundred years ago, because that was. Uh, a strike against the superstructure, against the order of the time. And no wonder we find ourselves in such a fractured place today where even the natural law is uh, ignored. Is that true? Yeah, that's exactly correct. You summarize it perfectly. Amazing. So we have this rejection of order uh, that has seeped into the church, but you know, it's most evident for, I think, people watching my videos in our world, right? And so you mentioned the transgenderism, and you, or you, maybe we shouldn't use that word. You, you're kind of uh, tippy toeing. That was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know, but it, it seems it to be the peak of ism. TG ism, yeah. Yeah, I guess it seems to be the the well, I mean, peak let's of. Just take that as an example. Um, if you can, if you can say we're redefining matrimony. See, matrimony is not like, well, I believe in traditional. It doesn't matter what you believe. I don't care what you believe. Matrimony is. God is the one who invented matrimony with Adam and Eve. Right. It's set. Right? It doesn't matter what's your take on matrimony. No, I don't care. God got to very early on, at the very beginning of, of, of mankind, he defined matrimony. And that's it. Now, if you're going to come along, there's a lot of conservatives are like, well, I don't, you know, who cares? Let them be married. You know, whatever. I'm conservative. I'm Christian. But if right. you grant that and you say, well, well, society can just change definitions that God's given. Yeah, you're just 24 hours away from saying, well, you can change what it means to be male and what it means to be female. Right. It's not very conservative at all. It's not conservative at all. It's, and it's, it's ultimately the spirit of Antichrist because you're saying we are God. We are going to redefine all these concepts. I'm happy that you use that word Antichrist. And I know you, um, you have a new book out. I have not read yet, but it's about the Antichrist. And then I also remember reading about uh, Our Lady of La Salette in your book. And some revelations that were given to a, a, a young lady at the time. And she mentioned at some point that it was revealed to her that Rome would be the seat of the Antichrist. Am I correct in, in, in restating that? Um, and then, of course, we yes. had the Pope that said that surely the smoke of Satan has entered the church. So can we argue with people when they confront Catholics with that? Hey, look. <laughs> The Roman Catholic Church, Rome, is the seat of the Antichrist, and we're, we're we have Catholic apparitions that say so. What do we make of that? Yeah, so th there is a apparition. An apparition is usually when Christ or one of the saints or an angel appears to someone, and the Catholic Church is called private revelations, and they're not binding on the entire church. Technically, only Scripture and tradition is binding, but th we do have these private revelations, and one of them is called Our Lady of La Salette. The Virgin Mary came down to France and spoke to two um, illiterate, poor children. And initially she said judgment is coming to France because of two reasons. Number one, people take God's name in vain. So if you're watching today and you're someone who says, oh my G or JC as like a cuss word or as an exclamation, you got to stop doing that because heaven is not happy with that. And then the second sin that France was guilty of was working on Sunday. So we also need to make sure that we're not working on Sunday. We're not taking God's name in vain. I think in our culture, people think, that's not a big deal. I'm not murdering anybody. But we've come a long way since the 1800s, haven't we, Elliot? 
Yeah. Yeah. All of this stuff is, is downstream. So Our Lady of La Salette said to these children that apocalyptic things are going to start happening. And one of the things mentioned, there's two versions of the secret revealed, is that Rome will lose the faith and become the seat of the Antichrist. It didn't say when that would happen, and it, it doesn't specify whether that means a pope will lose the faith, um, the entire lady of Rome, the clergy of Rome. We don't, we don't know exactly what it means, but we do know that a crisis will happen in Rome. Paired with that, just after that time of Our Lady of La Salette, there was a pope at the end of the 1800s named Pope Leo XIII, very good pope, holy pope. And he had a vision after Mass one day. We don't know all the details about it. I give the details that we do have in the book Infiltration, but basically he saw Satan and demons coming into the church in Rome. And in response to that, he wrote a prayer, which is extremely popular and extremely powerful, called the St. Michael Prayer. Um, our family prays it every day. And St. Saint, Saint Leo actually wrote two prayers. He wrote a long prayer for all the priest to pray, and then he wrote the shorter St. Michael prayer, which everyone says, which, which we pray. And usually if you pray the rosary with the group, uh, it'll be said at the end. If you go to a low mass, traditional Latin mass, you'll hear the St. Michael prayer. And he wanted this prayer to be said because he saw something demonic coming into the church. So we have this apparition at La Salette saying something demonic is going to happen, and then we have a pope saying something demonic is happening, and here are prayers for y'all to start praying to fight it. And that was all around just before 1900. So, you know, you can't say, well, this is just some conspiracy theory that I heard on YouTube when you've got the Virgin Mary and a Pope telling you, hey, this is what's about to happen. Yeah. And I mean, so, you know, th since reverting to the faith, there's a lot of things that I had to learn in order to defend the faith from people that don't understand it. I... How do I handle that one when someone says, yeah, but Rome is the seat of the Antichrist? Uh, yeah, it is. What do we as Catholics do? And how do, we, how, do we, how do we reconcile that within ourselves? I know that you're also a convert to the faith. How do you maintain your faith, love the faith, knowing that that's a fact? And what do you say to people that bring it to you? Sure. Well... First off, we don't know if currently Rome is the seat of the Antichrist. It's not been declared. There's certainly problems in Rome, but to say that is, that prophecy has definitely already come to pass, I think is something we should be careful on. Okay, so I, I, I'm not one that's going to say currently, right now, as we're speaking, Rome is the seat of the Antichrist. Okay, so I think we should be careful on that. Now, regarding the corruption in the Catholic Church, nobody can deny it. I don't care how liberal you are or how conservative you are. Anyone can look at the Catholic Church over a 2,000-year period and over the last, let's just choose the last 50 years and say, there's some corruption, there's some corruption, there's some corruption in the 1600s, there's some corruption in the 1500s, 1400s. Everyone's going to accept that. I'm a, I try to be as, as Catholic as you can get. I'm a sinner. I try. I try to be a practicing Catholic and, and, be, and be a holy person. But I'll tell you what, you look in the history of the church, you look now, there is corruption in the church. Now, somebody's watching right now and saying, Elliot's a Catholic, Taylor's a Catholic. Why are they still in it if it's corrupt? Why would you stay in a house that's on fire? And the answer is, there's only one true church. Nowhere in the Bible are you going to see two churches. You read the whole New Testament, it talks about church, the one true church. And it compares the true church to Noah's ark. You're either on the ark or you're outside in the flood. You got to stay in the church. Now, on the ark, there may be fistfights. There may be corruption. There may be problems. But I'm not jumping off the ark into the ocean because I'm going to die, right? Right? So you got to stay on the ark and you got to fight for what's true on the ark. This is in the Old Testament too. There was one, one Israel and one and only Israel. You couldn't go in the Old Testament and say, man, these priests and this king, they're corrupt. They're worshiping idols. I'm going to start Israel 2.0. I got new Israel fellowship over on this corner. Y'all come to my Israel. Now you can't do that in the Old Testament. There's one Israel. 
You got to deal with the Israel that God established. You can't start new fellowship, new ways, Israel denomination. You stay with the one true church and Christ himself, who is God promised us that in the church, there would be false prophets, false apostles and false shepherds. And he even said they would increase towards the end of time. So it's not like we, if he warned us that there's going to be false teachers and false brethren inside the church, we can't 2000 years later say, look at all this corruption in the church. Let's leave the church and start a new church. No, Jesus told us there will be false brethren, false prophets, false shepherds. He even used the analogy of wolves in sheep's clothing. Like the really bad people are dressed up like sheep. Like they're amongst us right now. They might be at church with you on Sunday. Those are the wolves. Those are the worst people. So the, the principle of infiltration isn't just like a really cool title that I thought of and put on the front of a book. It is taught by Jesus Christ in the New Testament and by St. Paul and by St. Peter and by St. Jude. Currently in the first century and currently in the 21st century, we are infiltrated by bad people. The message is leave the church and start a new church. No, the message is fight for the truth. Stay amongst the church. If someone comes into your house, Elliot, and is tying up your family and starting to steal all your stuff, is your response, well, I should go buy a new house and move out of here. <laughs> no, fight. I'm leave this house. No, you go to war. That's your house. That's right. Just because there's a robber in there doesn't mean, well, yeah, I guess I'm just going to have to go and go live in an apartment somewhere. Just leave my wife and kids here at this, one well, these criminal. No. You, you wage war. You fight for what is good, true, and beautiful. That's what we have to do. So I, I hope the message of, of this book is optimistic and positive. We identify the yeah. wolves in sheep's clothing, and then we fight for our house. We defend our home. It's interesting that you bring that up now, that it's, uh, it's Holy Week, and the, the gospel mm -hmm. reading of today uh, was about Judas, or at least it was Sunday, I think we reread it, was about Judas. And so even in his 12, there was an infiltration. Even amongst uh, the closest men to him, there was, I guess you could say, the, the, the smoke of Satan entered even 2,000 years ago. So you mentioned like a bunch of different years. You know, you mentioned the 1400, 1500, 1600s. Essentially, it seems like what we're experiencing for those who might despair is just basically the cyclical nature. Even in the Old Testament, it seems they're falling into grace or out of out of grace into grace, out of grace into grace, and so we're just kind of following the same cycle. It would seem correct. That's right. I mean, you look at the very beginning of time. And you have a betrayal by Lucifer and the fallen angels. It's mm. that the Bible says one third of the angels defected from God's plan and became dark demons. That's at the very beginning of creation. St. Augustine says when God separated the light from the darkness, that meant he was separating the dark angels, the fallen angels from the good angels. It's cool. We just learned that actually uh, cool. by studying your course. That was literally uh, Thursday, yeah. Tuesdays. That was about the cosmos. At New St. Thomas Institute. Yeah, awesome. thank you. Yeah, yeah so, good plug. Definitely a so plug that, for the that, new St. Thomas Institute. Just and, then you, and then you see in the garden, you got Adam and Eve. They're Satan right. infiltrating, screwing things up. Yeah. Then you got Cain and Abel. Cain kills Abel. I mean, it's every single generation. And then you get to the very climax of all the covenants of the entire redemptive history, the crucifixion of Jesus. And like you said, there's one of the 12 right there betraying him with a kiss. <laughs> right. I mean, literally, I mean, not to be gay or anything, the most intimate thing that a man could do for another man that's not gay, like weirdo, unnatural, is a kiss. Right. And that's what Judas uses to literally have Jesus murdered. So uh, prophetic and so poetic and so symbolic. I mean, it's, a, it's yeah, I mean, it's, it's, Literally, he is in Jesus' face, giving him the closest form of endearment, and that's his death sentence. Yeah, and that's in, in a way, that's where we are. We find ourselves again today. I'm curious, uh, you know, being a historian, you know, you know the history is a lot better than I do. Um, 
it seems that we're at like the worst it could possibly be. But I think that's because of our subjective experience. Uh, have there been times where there has been such a falling away? Have there been times where the infiltration brought the church to its knees or sought to uh, mutilate it from the inside out or mutate it as we see it today? And, you know, what hope do we have for its rebirth, I guess? Uh, well, before before Noah's flood, things were pretty nasty on earth. Uh, we don't know all the details, but the Bible said that was a pretty bad time. In the first couple centuries, I mean, to be baptized as a Christian was to accept martyrdom. So that was pretty rough. That was that was an exterior persecution on the faithful. What a lot of mystics and a lot of theologians say about our time or the future time is that just as Christ at the end of his life went through his passion and his suffering, he was he sweat drops of blood. He was whipped, scourged, his flesh ripped open. They put a crown of thorns on him. They punched him. They spit loogies on his face. They made him carry the cross. They nailed him to the wood. All that, that's the passion and suffering of Jesus Christ. These mystics say that because the church is the bride of Jesus, that she will be conformed with her spouse so that towards the end of time, the church will go through a passion. So she will be betrayed with a kiss. She will be imprisoned and marched out before Pontius Pilate. She will be scourged. A crown of thorns will be put on her head. The head is the sign of leadership, right? Um, carrying the cross, mocked publicly, nailed to a cross. But then the mystics say, and this is in my book, Antichrist and Apocalypse, the mystics say that there'll be this sort of eclipse of the church where Christ died. Now, we believe that his soul descended into hell and redeemed the Old Testament faithful, but he was behind a stone. You couldn't see him. And so the church will seem to be an eclipse. This church will seem to be gone. The enemies of God will be like, we finally destroyed the bride of Christ, the church. And then on the third day, there'll be a resurrection and the church will be manifested, and that will be the end of time. I think that's true. I think that mystical understanding of the end of the world uh, and the coming of the Antichrist will follow that plan of a persecution of the church, um, and then what seems to be the disappearance of the church, and then the reemergence of the church victorious at the very end of time. So, you know, we're in Holy Week right now, Elliot, and as we meditate on these things, and we go to these liturgies and we, we pray these prayers and we read these lessons from the Bible, we have to associate ourselves, Elliot Holtz, Taylor Marshall, whoever's watching, we have to associate ourselves with the passion and death of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. And to do that perfectly is to become a saint. If you can say, I am a sacrifice for my wife, for my kids, for the world, for the church, you will become a saint. You will find meaning. You will find true joy. You will find yourself in the glory of the resurrection. If you say, no, I want to live for my flesh. I want the concupiscence. I want to feel good by ingesting pharmaceuticals or doing drugs or just having as many orgasms as possible. you aren't going to find yourself in the glory of resurrection. You're going to find yourself in this world. I, I Honestly, in this world, people who live those lives, they find themselves on skid row at, at their end of the rope. And you will not find yourself in the glories of heaven. You'll find yourselves in the torments and the fires of hell. I know we're not, that's kind of politically incorrect to say, but that's what's the truth. I know that that's there's, a, there's so, a dogma in the church that there's no salvation outside of the church. And so, yeah, so it's, it's if you're going to be conformed to Jesus, you have to be conformed to his bride and his bride is the church. That's just straight up Bible. It's Bible 101, you know, so it's hard to do that. I mean, to be an apostle during the passion of Jesus was hard. Only one of the 12, St. Right. John stayed with that's, Jesus all the way to the cross. Yeah, that's right. So even, I mean, one betrayed him. One was at the cross, the other 10, 
we're afraid and hiding. So it's hard to do that. So I understand at our time, we look at culture, we look at the church, we look at all this hypocrisy and scandal and pedophilia and all that. We're like, man, but somehow through prayer and penance, we have to emerge as John, the apostle at the foot of the cross with Mary looking at Jesus crucified and saying, I don't understand how this all works out, but I'm going to stick here with Jesus. Let's uh, just backtrack for a moment about this rock that you mentioned uh, that obscured Christ in the grave, that now the idea is that the church will go through an eclipse in the same way, uh, that there's a rock that's going to cover the church. The church will sort of maybe disappear in a way. Um, and the infiltration. And so I'm curious, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on this idea that perhaps uh, it's this leveling out, equalizing uh, of all of the religions and like this new Pachimamo mass that I've heard you talk about and how, you know, ultimately the church will become obscured because it will be diluted with all kinds of wrong thinking, but then hybridized with what some people call like a new world or one world religion. Uh, is that where we're heading? What does this one world religion look like that's going to obscure the church? Well, it's interesting. If you read Daniel and you read the book of Revelation and you read the church fathers, it's actually not that. A lot of people think we're going to just blend all the world religions together into a new religion. But the prophet Daniel says that the Antichrist will suppress all idols and all religions, all forms of worship, which is shocking to people. Because, and if you read the church fathers, like Jerome, for example, he says in Augustine, the Antichrist and the devil, ultimate, they're, they're okay with you worshiping like, uh, who's that elephant head god? Ganesh. You know, the Hindus have Ganesh. Right, yeah, elephant that seems head. okay. They're like, okay, yeah, you worship Ganesh, you're not worshiping God, that's cool. You know, or you worship uh, Shiva or Buddha, whatever. They're like, cool, you know. But ultimately the devil and the antichrist are not satisfied with that. If you look at the devil tempting Jesus in the wilderness after 40 days of fasting, severe penance, he says, bow down and worship me. Satan says that to Jesus. That's the temptation, right? He wants, that's what he wants. So we know that the antichrist will be perfectly possessed by Satan. That's a doctrine of the church. And ultimately, Satan wants to be worshipped. So St. Paul says, so Daniel says that he'll suppress all of their religions and idols. Paul says that the Antichrist, the man of sin, will set himself up in the temple in Jerusalem to be worshipped by the world. So ultimately, what will, now there might be one world religion, right? But ultimately, at the very, very end with the Antichrist, the only object on earth that will be tolerated for worship will be the Antichrist himself possessed by Satan. There will only be one religion. The Antichrist will say, don't worship Ganesh, Shiva, Jesus, Buddha, whatever. It's going to be, I am in the temple. I am God. I am the messianic figure. Worship me and me alone. And that's, that relates to the mark of the beast. Uh, we could, you know, that's a whole other conversation. So ultimately, one world religion might happen, but that's not the ultimate plan of Satan and the Antichrist. Hmm. It sounds a lot like, well, globalism, uh, new world order, and like global communism, right? Where all the power is consolidated uh, into one body or one individual, uh, and everyone is stripped of all faith uh, and any narrative that is outside of our Lord and Savior, the communist dictator of the new world order. How close are, it seems like we're so close to that. Uh, what are your thoughts on like the, uh, the um, you know, modern unfoldings of, uh, of that magnitude? Like, so the pandemic was evidence that maybe he was trying his hand at something. Um, is the antichrist here? Is this, is this where we find ourselves? So if, if you read the first epistle of St. John, it's towards the end of the New Testament. 
He says there are many antichrists, plural, and then he says there is the antichrist, singular. So what we have to understand is, and he even refers to antichrists, plural, in the first century when John is writing the first epistle of St. John. So even in the time of the apostles, there were antichrists. What does antichrist mean? Anti in Greek, A-N-T-I, can mean against, or it can mean in the place of. So we have like words like antibiotics, antibodies, stuff like that, right? Uh, so an antichrist is against Christ, but he also puts himself in the place of Christ. So he's opposed and in the place. So any dictator, any globalist, any atheist, John says anyone who denies Jesus is of the spirit of antichrist and is an antichrist, lowercase a. So that's going to apply to the minds at the French Revolution. It's going to apply to Nero Caesar. It's going to apply to Domitian. It's going to apply to Diocletian. Any great enemy of of God and his logos. What about Joe Biden? Those are antichrist. So right now there are antichrists. People got really upset because uh, I did a podcast when um, after Queen Elizabeth of England died and they made King Charles, you know, king. I said, King Charles is an antichrist figure. Boy, that really ticked off people. And like, you're saying he's the anti- I'm not saying he's the antichrist. Get your Bible facts straight. I'm saying he is an antichrist. Why? Because he is the putative head of a nation and a religion. Because England has its own religion, the Church of England, which is right. not the Catholic faith. Right. It's a different religion. And he's the head. Not a bishop, not a pastor, not a priest is the head of the Church of England. King Charles is the head of that religion. And if you say that a king or a layman, who, by the way, doesn't really have Christian faith, and is basically a progressive elitist globalist, that he's the leader. That's an, that's an antichrist situation, an antichrist, not the antichrist. So yeah, I mean, King Charles would apply. You could say maybe Biden. You could, you know, the list goes on and on of figures that you could say are anti-Christian. That's ultimately what an antichrist is, is someone who's an anti-Christian. Uh, and it's going to increase as time goes on. So I, I think... To go back to your question, Elliot, I think we will move towards a one world religion where it's sort of like Pachamama, Ganesh, Shiva, Buddha, Jesus. It's all the same thing. I think that's going to kind of right. coalesce into whatever that is, right? Where everybody's just like doing a group hug about around spiritual things. But once that is achieved, there will come a time where the Antichrist says, that is all suppressed. All eyes on me, as Tupac said. All eyes on me. Only worship me. That will be the end. Like if that, when you see that happening, that's the abomination of desolation. All worship of every single human on earth, all directed to one man who demands total allegiance politically and, and, and spiritually, that's the Antichrist. And that's the end. You got three and a half years of that, and that's the end. And that's the will of God. It's not the positive will of God. God does not will anyone to reject him or to sin, but he allows wickedness to happen. Satan is the prime example. And he will allow one human, the Antichrist, to be the most wicked human ever. I guess we could debate who's more wicked, Judas Iscariot or the Antichrist? I, I don't was, know. I was likening I the Antichrist to uh, to Lucifer, right? Just allowing that one to say, okay, you want to take the reins? Grab them and go. So he was uh, like an Antichrist yeah. as well. And the Antichrist will be perfectly possessed. So people who are possessed now are not perfectly possessed. Hmm. So even people who are possessed by demons right now, if you talk to Father Ripperger, he'll say they still like at moments have their own will and they, you know, will say, yeah, I'd like to have a ham sandwich today or, you know, or you can drive themselves to the store and then they'll have demonic attacks, right? But, but the, and they're, and sometimes they're opposed to it. They don't want the demon in them, right? But the Antichrist will invite solemnly Satan into him to completely take over his will, his mind, his, 
affections, his passions. So he will, he will in a way become perfectly conformed to the devil. Uh, I, I don't know the exact quote, but I remember reading your book. You quote somebody who says that the Antichrist, he'll be born with teeth. Like as I, when I read that or I heard that, I was like, wow, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, that's in, I believe, in Our Lady of La Salette. <laughs> yeah, I got to look that up, but I think that that's where it comes from. I didn't, I didn't come up with that. Right. It's an Our Lady of La Salette. Yeah, I know you were quoting something, and it was such a creepy image that yeah. came to my mind. It was like, it's yeah. It's creepy baby just a baby well and there's and also in la salette and there's other traditions that the antichrist will be born of an adulterous or fornication union with a nun who is jewish so right. a, a hebrew woman who becomes catholic and becomes a nun that the the mother of the antichrist will be a consecrated woman of jewish descent is uh is a pretty common belief so this info which makes sense because you, you think about the, the Antichrist is an anti-Messiah, so he's going to mock everything that was true of Jesus. That's right. The, it, the book of Revelation says he'll even have a fake resurrection event. That's so right. So the idea that he would be born of some sort of consecrated Jewish woman, just as Mary was a consecrated Jewish woman, right. uh, Satan is going to want to copy that somehow. I've heard the term ape, ape of the church, and it seems a lot mm -hmm. of the enemies, you know, the secret societies, they almost take some of the rituals of the church uh, and reenact them, but in a inverted way. It's interesting. Yes. Well, you see that, you know, when you watch some of these um, cultural phenomena, like the Grammys, the Emmys, mm -hmm. the Oscars, you see them incorporating a lot of Catholic imagery. Right. Uh, iconography. Madonna does this all the time. Right. She just did a cover photo for uh, was it Vanity Fair, and one of them is where she's with all these like trans-looking people doing a Last Supper in which she is Jesus. Right. <laughs> uh, there's another one where she's depicted as Our Lady of Sorrows. Right. But it's all inverted and and sacrificial. And you know when you when you learn about ritual satanic abuse, which is what some of these Catholic priests are doing to boys and girls and women and men, um, they're using rituals, liturgies, sacraments as, it's so sick and gross, Elliot, but they're using these as the context for abuse. So it's not just enough that they want to be perverted and nasty, they want to be perverted and nasty and bring somehow God and the angels and Mary and the saints into it, and it's really, it's really foul. It's really disgusting. So is it, to safe, is it safe to say that uh, this infiltration that you've documented so well in your book and give historical account and facts um, has as its end this one world order, um, one world religion, uh, antichrist uh, pulling the puppet strings of the world that we're talking about right now, and that the Catholic Church was a bulwark in his way, and so ultimately he had to destroy it from the inside out. Uh, it's succeeding. It looks like it's succeeding. There will be an eclipse. My qu my final question to you, which would probably open up a few other questions, is, well, then what do we do? How do we proceed? How do we move forward without losing faith? And what is our job here in this generation uh, as Catholics or someone who's hearing this and is uh, open to the idea that this infiltration uh, is, uh, is is present and it's unfolding and they don't want to stand for it. They want to they want to speak up or do something about it. So, I mean, if we're honest with ourselves, Elliot, I I am not a cardinal. I'm not an archbishop. I'm right. not a priest. I'm a layman. So my spiritual responsibility is for my wife and my kids. And from extension of that, my outside of my nuclear family, and then my friends and my neighbors. And then just like you, I have an outward apostolate podcast books that I try to reach other people, but primarily I have to save my own soul and then inspire and encourage my wife and my kids. So that's what we have to do. And so what I tell men, because I think if we get the men, if we get the husbands and the fathers, we get the wife and the kids. So let's aim for that, right? I say to them, do you pray every morning and evening? Do you lead your family before all three meals in prayer? 
if you're Catholic, do you pray the rosary with your family every day? If you don't, you're wrong. You need to just start. Do you go to church every single Sunday without exception unless you're ill? You have to take up the cross and live the basic, bare essentials of what it means to be a Christian. Do you read the Bible every day? Because that's your game plan in understanding the will of God for your life and understanding the doctrine and the morality that Christ came to teach. So these are the very basics. And then we, all of us men need to be fasting. We have to be doing penance and the preferred penance in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, in the history of Christianity is fasting. So the church prescribes us to focus on Fridays as a good Friday, as a crucifixion day, to do some form of penance. Don't eat meat, skip a meal, maybe have one meal, maybe have no meals. Um, when you go to a restaurant, instead of ordering the first thing you want, order the second thing you want. Uh, don't use condiments. I mean, whatever it is, don't put salt on their food. You have to be saying to your flesh, no. You're, I mean, you're great at this, Elliot. You know, it's, it's, we have to be fighting against our concupiscence, fighting against our flesh. You know, we cannot be slaves to drugs, alcohol, and pornography. Can't, right? We have to ask for the grace of God to rise above that. Can, are there times that we might stumble and fall? God has a means for that. Confession, stand back up, start over again. Let's keep going. So I think we, we just have to focus on our own little gardens, yeah. our own little kingdoms. Let's build that. And if we can, in our spare time, in our extra energy, help other men, other families, other communities, that's going to be the only way forward. I don't really see you or me becoming president um, for four years in America, or you or me becoming Pope or Cardinal, uh, we gotta we gotta focus on our own. And and maybe it's maybe it's the inversion of the ultimate data. If we're not at the end times, I kind of think we're feeling getting close. But maybe it's we can't save this generation as is. But maybe we can somehow the next generation inspire with virtue and 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 Christian morality and the Christian faith and inspire. Maybe it's one, maybe it's your child, Elliot, who's the next Pope who does great things, or maybe it's my grandchild. I don't know. But, uh, I think we just focus on the commission that God's given us as husbands and fathers. Wow. I couldn't have said it better, man. That's amazing. Perfect answer. Uh, Taylor, please share where you would like people to learn more about you. Uh, you know, I just have to say, I've read a lot of your books. He's, you're an author of many books, as well as taking your online courses, which have been very helpful to me and my family in learning the faith. Um, so that's my endorsement, but where would you like people to go? Yeah. If you just, if you want to get more into the content, I, I encourage you, you can go to YouTube and I've got a, a popular podcast there called just the Dr. Taylor Marshall podcast on YouTube. And um, then if you want, you, I have books on Amazon. I have uh, a number of books. I think there's 11 books now. And uh, if you want to go deeper, uh, you can take online courses. So I have about 10 courses online. I have an Old Testament course, a New Testament course, philosophy course, theology course, church history, Latin mass course. So if you want to take one of those courses, you can go to nsti.com. That's New St. Thomas Institute. New St. Thomas Institute, nsti.com. Taylor, thank you so much, man. I appreciate you. I appreciate your time spending here with us today, bro. Thank you, Elliot. It's, it's an honor to talk with you because back in 2015-ish, 16-ish, I got really into fitness. And you know, I was trying to get in the thousand pound club and was working on my deadlifts and squats. And I found your videos and I was watching them every week. I was super into Yo <laughs> Elliot. And um, you really did inspire me and, uh, and helped me a lot. Uh, with your advice through the internet. So even though we didn't know each other, so I just, I think it's really, I never, and I remember you talking about like, remember talking about Taoism and some other stuff. I was like, man, we got to get this guy <laughs> Catholic, you know? So it's pretty cool. You know, here we are, I guess, seven years later, and we're having an interview about Catholicism yeah. and virtue and the church. It's just, it's really awesome. So um, thanks for having me. And I'm, I'm definitely encouraged by your witness. Yeah, it's it's amazing how it's come full circle. 
And uh, you kind of paid me, you, the payback has been helpful. You know, like I've learned a lot by watching you in the yeah. reverse. And also the faith itself has brought a lot of, a lot of clarity to what I was doing in fitness. And so I always had a spiritual aspect to what I taught spirit, physically. Yes. Um, but now through the Catholic faith, I mean, the resurrection of the body is the best way to describe it. Really glorifies yeah. and, and resurrects uh, fitness in a way that I'm excited to begin sharing here pretty soon. It's all kind of new to me, though. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I always thought you were a real, you know, philosophical, intellectual guy. So I, I guess it was just a matter of time before you you came, turned the corner, came in the church, and I hope one day uh, we'll, we'll work out together and we'll go to a Latin mass. Yeah, I think it'll happen. Bring it all together. <laughs> God bless you, Taylor. All right, man. God bless. If you're a high-achieving businessman, executive, or entrepreneur who's dominating in business but struggle with drinking, drugs, overeating, or any filthy vice, here's some advice. The biggest mistake that you could make is to try to quit cold turkey and use willpower to overcome your cravings. If you've ever quit for a few days or a few weeks only to self-sabotage by binging worse than before, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. Not only has my company helped thousands of men destroy vice and dominate life, I personally confronted and overcome the same struggles when I found myself hooked on weed at the peak of my business career. If you've got four minutes to listen to a coach who will help you achieve total self-mastery and control over your inner punk, then listen up. If you don't beat drinking, drugs, or any life-draining dependency in 90 days or less, not only will my company give you your money back, we'll pay for your first month's stay at a rehab retreat of your choice. That's what you need to succeed. So let's go, bro. Just visit waronvice.com fill out an application and my team will get back to you with the details. Hope to see you on the inside. Done.